A little art history lesson before we begin. If you, go, um, if you go next door to the chapel, which I highly recommend that you do at the conclusion of this morning service, you will see uh, there above the, of the altar next door a uh, stained glass depiction of the story that Ken just read for us, the story of Jesus transfigured on the mountain with Moses on his left hand, I think, and Elijah on his right. And you'll see Moses there, and he's got the, you know, the Ten Commandments in his hand, and he's got these two little, um, like, spotlights, these little car headlamps coming out of his... Of his head. And so at 8 o'clock, this, this works a lot better if you can like look at it. We actually did a little, I made the 8 o'clockers talk to me this morning, just <laughs> FYI. They don't do that very often, but they did. I said, what do you see? What do you think that is? Uh, and there was, you know, this kind of stunned silence as, you know, they figured out that I actually wanted them to say something. And, um, and finally a woman said, it looks like he has horns. And it does. Some of you may know the famous statue by Michelangelo of Moses that's in the, um, I think it's the church of San Pietro de something. Uh, Michelangelo was commissioned to, to do statues for a pope, Pope Julius II. And there's a famous statue, it's eight feet tall, seated of Moses, big, muscular, angry, bearded. And Moses has got these little fawn horns coming out of his head. You, you'll see depictions of this in Renaissance art, sometimes even mid, in medieval art, this idea that Moses has these horns. And that idea actually comes from the reading, the first reading that we heard this morning from Exodus. Usually we translate it, Moses didn't know that his face was shining. The people saw it, they made him put a veil on it. But in the second century, St. Jerome translating the Bible into Latin, the Latin Vulgate, which was the, the only translation available for about a thousand years in Europe, St. Jerome mixed up two uh, Hebrew cognates and translated that line as Moses did not know that he was horned. So for a thousand years, people like Michelangelo and everybody in Europe thought that this story was about Moses coming down the mountain with these horns on his head. And that that's, I mean, understandably, that's why the people made him put a veil over it, right? They're like, dude, you have horns on your head. That's terrifying. Please, <laughs> please cover it up. Now we know Jerome got it wrong. It was a mistranslation. But I, I kind of, I'll just admit, I like the horned Moses better than the shiny Moses. I always like the weirder stuff more than the, you know, the beautiful stuff. There's growing consensus that glowing face is really what the text says. And the shining face works a lot better when it, this story is coupled with this transfiguration story, right? Where Jesus climbs up a mountain and talks to God, and then these two prophets are on either side of him. And the text says he is transfigured before them. His clothes and his face become dazzling white. It's probably actually a writer who knows that earlier Exodus story, who's picking up the details of this is what happens when you talk to God. You start glowing. It's so unsettling that his disciples have to, have to shield themselves from this glow, just as the people of Exodus had done when they made Moses put the veil on. Maybe God's glory dazzles you with its brightness. Maybe God's glory makes you break, break out in horns. It's like the worst kind of acne you can possibly imagine. You decide which translation you prefer. Paul, in the second reading, all three of our readings are about this story, right? They're all about Moses shining in various ways. And Paul is riffing on this idea in his letter too, the second letter to the Corinthians. Paul has no knowledge of the horned tradition. That's going to come several years later. But for Paul, this veil that Moses wears symbolizes not actually anything happening to Moses. It's a symbol of the people and their recalcitrance. Right? It means hard-heartedness. And here, Paul is not actually really talking about the children of Israel in the book of Exodus. Paul is telling the story in this particular way to make a point to the community he himself is writing to, a community that he has founded in Corinth, a community with whom he is very angry. Right? We don't know all the details. They did, so Paul doesn't spell them out. But we can kind of read between the lines a little bit, and the gist of it seems to be that there are some people in Corinth, some other teachers, some false prophets maybe, who are peddling maybe a brand of Judaism that Paul does not like. Remember, Paul is a Jew, and he is writing to Jews in this letter. So Paul is using this very Jewish story from Exodus about Moses and the veil to make a point about his enemies, right? To this day, Paul says, whenever Moses is read, and he's talking about the Pentateuch there, the first five books of Hebrew scripture, whenever Moses is read, he says, that veil is still there. Now, on the surface of things, that sounds pretty dang anti-Jewish. And this is actually one of the texts in the New Testament that has been used to justify anti-Jewish violence for many centuries. This is a text with blood on its hands, and we need to be really careful about it. What Paul, though, I think, is doing is not actually Jews are bad and Christians are good. That's the way that Christians have tended to read it. Paul is playing with the image of the veil, the thing that we use to protect ourselves from a direct encounter with God's holiness. And he's using the story from his sacred scripture, from Jewish scripture, 
about what happens when somebody encounters God directly, and then the consequences, both for the people and for the prophets, when that glory, when that vision, when that radiance is revealed. People tend to want you to cover it up, right? It's like you come down from the mountain with horns on your head, and that terrifies people. The prophet with horns, right? The prophet with horns has become the image of the prophet who scares us. So there's a warning, I think, embedded in these texts. It's not a warning about Jews refusing to acknowledge Jesus. Paul is talking about deceit, right? He's talking about shame. He says, we have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves into the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. We speak with our faces unveiled, he says. I am very aware that I am speaking to a congregation with faces veiled. <laughs> I get that this is a kind of a weird text to read, um, and this is, uh, this is not the day for you to remove your veils. I am very sorry. I believe that day will come. It is not today. Uh, but, but what Paul is talking about is a direct encounter with God, right? We have seen God's glory for ourselves. We have spoken with God directly. We have seen the vision, and we know what we're talking about. Because once you've seen the glory, once you've got a glimpse of the magic, once you've tasted the freedom that comes with letting go, it's really hard then to go back down the mountain without suffering some consequences. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We have let go of the idea that in order to pass among polite people, we have to keep telling lies about who we are. We are not willing to dress up who we actually are in the respectable clothes of a cocktail party. We are not willing to put on that veil anymore. We're ready to let our horns show. That's what Paul's saying. And that's why I love this older, weirder, incorrect translation. I think it's a remarkable way to read these texts. St. Saint Jerome, Michelangelo, the guy who did our stained glass next door, these artists are onto something, as misguided as the translation they're working with may be. We're not gonna put the veil back on. We're ready to let our horns show. In the halcyon days of the before times, before the pandemic shut it down, uh -huh, I used to go occasionally to a Saturday night dance party over in Southeast Portland. A friend of mine started it a number of years ago, and it was, it was kind of founded to be a safe space for trans kids, right? A place for people who were transitioning. Maybe they had already undergone some surgery and the scars hadn't healed up all the way. Maybe they were just starting their transition and were viscerally aware of all the ways in which the body they brought into the world did not match up to the person God had created them to be. When you're living in that kind of situation, right? When you're, when you're in, that, in that context, a sweaty dance floor can be a pretty daunting place. Certainly not a safe space for queer kids who are struggling with all kinds of issues around body image and uncertainty and the very real threat of physical violence. So this week, as the governor of Texas started pushing to prosecute the parents of transgender kids for child abuse, as 35 different states consider anti-trans legislation, 35 states, I've been thinking a lot about that dance party I used to go to and what it, what it meant. It was called Pants Off, Dance Off. The motto was, rock on with your socks on. You came in, they handed you this garbage bag for whatever you wanted to shed. You stuffed your money and your ID in your shoes, and then you stripped as bare as you dared. Most of us were in some, you know, it was a lot of jock straps and booty shorts. But everybody did it, right? We were in this together. It was a place where there was no shame, there was no stigma. It was safe to look, it was safe to be seen. It was safe to be the person God created you to be. You could lose your veil and embrace your horns, however uncomfortable those horns may have made other people. It was our faces unveiled party. And a lot more than faces went unveiled. It would start pretty small. It was kind of awkward. It was just a few people, you know, dancing in small groups. But by the end of the night, that dance floor was a sweaty, pulsating, glory-filled room of people, guys and girls and everybody in between, a, a jubilant celebration of the human body in all of its marvelous and shocking diversity. Everybody belonged at Pants Off Dance Off. It was... It was an image for me of what the kingdom of God could look like. 
I have to tell you, I hesitated before preaching about that party for all kinds of reasons that you can probably imagine. I'm guessing that it's more than a little uncomfortable for a few of you to hear your priest tell you about the clothing optional dance party that he used to <laughs> go to. But our world is full of sickness and pain right now. The violence around us is thick. All kinds of people are really vulnerable to war and to fascism and every kind of human evil. In the context of war and violence, why wax nostalgic about a dance party that some might say really does not belong up here in the hallowed pulpit of Trinity Episcopal Cathedral? As weird as it feels to tell you about the dance party I used to go to, it was even weirder for me to go to it, at least at first. The first time I went, I found myself viscerally uncomfortable walking into a space that was precisely designed to be a safe space for people with shame. And it turns out that some of us who carry around a lot of that shame are clergy. And my shame was about all kinds of things, but part of it was the very real fear that somebody from my quote-unquote real life would recognize me there, right? Hey, aren't you the priest at Trinity Cathedral? Those are words I dreaded to hear. And every time somebody came up to me, especially at first, I was convinced, like, this is the end, right? They're all going to find out that I'm going to this party and I will lose my job. And what would invariably happen was that by the end of the night, I had figured out how to push through that fear and anxiety and shame and let go of my veil and join this dance. Because these are the people who showed me what church is meant to be. It was like Moses descending from Mount Sinai, like Jesus standing with the prophets, this fabulous mountaintop dance party that Luke describes, when normal people are suddenly transfigured before your very eyes, and you see them the way God created them to be. That's what happens, and when that happens, whether it's on the top of a mountain or the bottom of a dance floor, in that moment, the glory of the Lord is revealed. And there are precious few things more glorious than seeing that image of God. As St. Irenaeus famously described it 2,000 years ago, the glory of God, he said, is a human being fully alive. I think that's what these weird Bible stories are really all about, human beings coming fully alive because we're encountering one another with honesty and glory. And when we do that, we get these glimpses of the glory of God, as it were, with our faces unveiled. And that encounter comes with a price. I mean, it changes you, right? Pants Off, Dance Off kind of changed my life. It was a conversion experience of a kind. I met God on that dance floor. That gathering showed me something really important about myself, about the other people around me, people, I mean, to the point who have, been, who have been frightened off by this church and everything that we stand for, and so have to seek out these other places to practice their religion, which is a religion of deep honesty and truthfulness and integrity and justice and compassion and fun. St. Paul says it so much better than I can. He says, we have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. So I commend to you your horns, <laughs> which is just a variant translation for your radiant faces, shining with the glory of the God who made you. I commend to you your body, which is perfect and beautiful and is actually being transfigured even as we sit in this room. Paul says that where the Spirit of God is, that's freedom, wherever and whenever this Spirit shows up. And every single one of us with our faces unveiled are being transformed into that image from one degree of glory to another. Think about that. We are already being transformed from glory to glory and the end of that path, right, does not stop with death. That's where Paul's going. In the, in the end, right, at the last day, that glory transfiguration is but a preparation for the ultimate transformation, right? The, the final revealing of the butterflies inside these sorry old cocoons that we are dragging around with us, unsuccessfully trying to dress up and clean up and make respectable and hide. But what these texts have to say is that you are already glorious. That's what Jesus reveals on the mountain. We are already glorious, exactly as we are. And we're gonna get even more glorious as we go. 
The transformation has already begun, and God only knows where that transfiguration ends.